Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, so much uh, that you've done, but maybe we can start with like your journey. So how, how did the journey to becoming this athlete, multi-gold medal winning, multi-world multi champion, how did that start? Well, I think if you ever asked where my career ended, would end up, uh, it definitely wouldn't have been sport because I love sport growing up. I tried lots and lots of different sports but I was rubbish at all of them. So I tried running, my two younger sisters used to beat me. I did a kayaking course and actually got a certificate to say I'd achieve more swimming than canoeing. <laughs> Kept falling out of it. And, and swimming, yeah, not great at that either. I look like a demented mm -hmm. turtle. But <laughs> <laughs> honestly, sport, I love sport. It was great fun. Um, I, I enjoyed meeting new people, making new friends. It was never a career choice, it was a lifestyle choice, but I became disabled as a teenager mm -hmm. and that was very, very difficult. It meant that I had to give up a lot of the mm -hmm. sports I loved doing and I hated that. So I looked around for one that I could do, one that didn't involve running or walking and I figured archery was a good idea and turned out to be quite good at it. Wow. So um, there's a lot you covered there. Just, I mean, maybe just for people who don't know you, um, tell us a little about the, the, the disability and, and, and how that affected you because it came on as a, as a teenager. Mm. Yeah, I've got something called complex regional pain syndrome. So it's a neurological condition that causes chronic pain in both my feet all the time. It started when I was 11 years old. So uh, after I'd been running, it hurt in my feet. And then it progressively got worse. So at 13, it was there all the time. I didn't actually get a diagnosis till I was 16 years old. So my very first trip to London was actually to Great Ormond Street Hospital oh. to get my diagnosis. And yeah, I, I got that and learned that there was no cure. Of course, and how was that affecting you in your day-to-day -day life as you were sort of 13, 14, 15? What, what was the effect on you? Well, living in pain is very draining. Mm. Uh, so physically, it was very, very hard. But I think psychologically, it affected me much more. You know, as a, a teenager, you're learning who you are and who you want to be and what you want to do with the rest of your life. And I just had this additional problem thrown into the mix. And especially in a world where physical perfection is priced so highly, I felt <laughs> broken. And my self-worth plummeted, my self-esteem plummeted. And I had huge fears about my future, whether these big dreams that I, I had would be possible anymore, whether people would see past my crutches, mm. the wheelchair that I use, uh, and see the value that lay beneath. So that was really, really tough. Tough thing to take in a, at a tough time of life in which to take it on, as, as, yeah. as you say. And um, it was around that time. You, you make it sound very easy, but you decided I could, I could do something where I, where I can can do something sporty. And archery is is it? But did you know people who did archery? What led you to, to picking up an arrow for the first time? Yeah, it's quite an unusual sport. And to be honest, I think for a long time, I didn't realize it existed outside of medieval history and fairy stories. Right. But uh, somebody on the school bus did it. And they told me about their, their archery and how much fun it was. And I, the more they were talking about it, I thought I could do that. So I, I got their number. And my mom and dad said, if I really wanted to do it, I had to arrange it all. And it coincided with my 15th birthday. So they said that could be my birthday present. Yeah. I rang up, I booked my spot on the, uh, the course and my dad and I did it uh, for my 15th birthday. I can begin to see some of the drive that uh, propels you subsequently in, in that. So first time you pick up a bow and arrow, is that what we yep. call it? Yep, bow and arrow, yeah. Um, did you immediately know this is the sport for me? Did you just like hit the bullseye straight away and then, no. you know, the heavens <laughs> opened? No? No, no, no. I was terrible. Um, it was a miracle if I could hit the target, never mind the middle of it. But it was just so much fun. You know, I was back outside. I was yeah. back doing something. And it was just so different to a lot of the other sports that I tried. A lot of the other sports have been very uh, team based, especially at school. Mm. And this was uh, individual. And I loved the fact that it was about me, my performance and just trying to get everything right. So trying to get that perfect shot. And I, I really, really appealed. So I just practiced lots. Yeah. And three years later, I was on the Great Britain team. Wow. Three years later, from, from for the first time you pick up the equipment to three years later on the, on the British team. Mm -hmm. That's pretty unusual in any sport. So you must have had some special talent. Uh, yeah, well, I was uh, lots and lots of practice. Right. So my, my but, parents... you know, you can only do so much practice in three years. 
Yeah, well, my parents let me shoot in the lounge. You had a target in the lounge, and <laughs> they'd be watching TV, don't and I'd try be this shooting. No, 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 please don't, please don't. Yeah, so uh, they, they were really supportive, and it was my... If I could get through school, and I was well enough to get through school, I got my archery practice at the end of it to look forward to, so... And uh, what does it take to be good as uh, an arrow shooter or an archer? Um, what, what would you say is the essence of uh, being really successful in that sport? It has to be dealing with pressure. Right. So we're shooting at a target that's 70 metres away, so any tiny mistake this end has a huge impact yeah. down at the target. So when it really, really matters, it's, it's who can cope with those nerves better and make the best shots under pressure. We'll come on to talk a bit more about the pressure, I hope. That, um, tell me about the pain and the pressure and how they work together. So what was it like for you when you started to get serious about archery dealing with chronic regional um, pain syndrome? Was, so, it, was it there all the time? Was it distracting to you? It feels like it must be something that's difficult to deal with in those moments. Yeah, it is difficult to deal with, and the, the way I deal with it is I've got to keep busy all the time. Right. So when I was shooting, I was really focused on what I was doing, that I wasn't concentrating on, on the pain. It was still there, but it was removed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, even more so when I was in competition, mm -hmm. when I had that adrenaline rush, it was even further in the background. So hence why I, I did it so much. So it sort of pushes it to the background. The more mm -hmm. pressure there is, the less you notice the pain, I guess, yeah. the more focus yeah. you have to have. Now, um, in this book, I've, I've begun to enjoy the book. You tell a story early on about a year after I started archery, I was invited to help out at the Junior World Championships. When I saw the Great Britain team in their red track suits, a shiver ran down my spine. So tell us about that moment. What changed for you then? Oh, it was just incredible. So my club had nominated me to go down and be a flag bearer at the, uh, the World Championships, which was held in Lillishaw. And all the countries walked in with their tracksuits and Great Britain came in last wearing the, their red tracksuits. And it, I, it was just amazing. And I thought, I want one of those. And I, I don't think I've ever wanted anything quite as badly. I saw that tracksuit and it just, it really motivated me. So once I had that goal, I was determined to make it come true uh, and every time I go to practice I'd be thinking about that red tracksuit I want that so badly what can I do to to make me um, or improve my standard to get there why, why did you think that that sort of fixation uh, landed in you like that I just think to represent your country is a huge honor and it you know you you're really good at something if you if you're that sort of minority um, representing your country. So I really wanted to be able to put on that tracksuit and know that my ability was good enough. Mm -hmm. And I, I did actually make the, the junior team, I think, uh, two years later. So, wow. Yeah. So after the red tracksuit moment, did you increase your practice? Were you allowed to practice in the bedroom and around the house more? What, what, what changed? Was it just kind of continued focus? Yeah, it was a continued focus yeah. and also I think um, I was 16, 17 at the time, so very difficult time in terms of growing up and I remember my mum giving me a choice and she said, you, you, you've got a choice to make, you either go for your archery and if you want to do that we will support you all the way, but you be selfish and you put this first if your friends are going out um, and, and you what you're invited, you can go, but if it's going to affect your archery, you don't. So she's like, you've got, you've got a choice. You either have your social life or your archery, but you make your choice now. If you, and whatever you choose will support you. And I, it was just sort of the thought of that track. So I'm like, no, I really want that. Didn't take long to deliberate that. No, no, no. no. I, I wanted that so badly. Wow. So, yeah. And you obviously started to do pretty well in competitions pretty quickly. Can you remember the first time you won something and felt like the, maybe the red trap suit was a step closer? Yeah, I actually won the junior national championships the first time uh, we went. And honestly, my, my dad and I went down. The first time you went? Yes, wow. yeah. We were completely clueless. Yeah. It was held in Coventry. And I don't know what, what we did. Uh, we ended up in the, uh, I think they were doing a, a dog show next door. And we ended up in, in there. And I'm like, well, this doesn't look quite right. It's a different kind um, of sport, shooting yeah, dogs, yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, we eventually found the right room and everybody else seemed to know what they were doing. It was, um, yeah, my, my dad and I hadn't got a clue, just went there, shot arrows at the target and uh, I came away uh, and won the event and that, that was able-bodied. We, we don't have very many mm. disabled 
competitions domestically in archery. Right, so your first major win, junior championships, able-bodied, yeah. so you're the national champion at that point? Yes. First yeah. time you turned up? Yes. Did you feel the pressure? No, no. Um, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, there, were, there was a few nerves bubbling away, but uh, it was more excitement, mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed that and found that when I was put under pressure, my scores went up, mm -hmm. and I, I loved it, yeah. So from that moment to, um, well, Beijing was your, your first Olympic gold. That was only another couple of years. Yep. So talk us about how you, how you got to being in that Olympic final in Beijing. Uh, sorry, the process to Yeah, so what to took you to from, from that first win to, to wow. Beijing and what, what changed in that period for you? So actually my first international competition is definitely worth mentioning yeah. because uh, it, in many ways it was a complete failure. Uh, I, I went to my, my first international, I, I broke two world records in the ranking round, great start, but you don't win medals for that bit. Those are re records based on the number of points or? Yes, okay. number of points. So in uh, the ranking round was over 144 arrows over four oh. different distances. So I, I broke one for the 70 meter distance and the overall round. Okay. So that was... Uh, you knew you were doing well. Yeah, yeah, that was a great start. Yeah. And uh, then it was the match play bit, and I love match play. You know, in the UK, as soon as that pressure went on, my scores always went up. But this time in front of that crowd, I completely fell to pieces. I couldn't control my shot. I was spraying the arrows everywhere, and if I could run, I'd have been out of there quicker than a speeding bullet. Um, but I, I learned so much from that event. You know, I, failing there, I, I realized that, um, well, firstly, I needed to deal with nerves better. I was yeah. out of my comfort zone. That was tough. Secondly, I was really complacent. I thought that because I'd done so well at the ranking round and because match play was the bit that I was good at, I thought it would be a walkover. And I learned that competition isn't one on paper and I needed to approach every match and competitor the same. Mm -hmm. And also I got my A-level results that morning and found out whether or not I got into university. Okay, that's quite distracting. So, yeah, that was very distracting. Okay. So, yeah, whilst I probably wouldn't uh, experience that again, I had to learn how to deal with distractions better. It sounds like you, um, your ability to analyse your performance or your lack of it on, on that day was, was very strong. Was that something you did on your own? Did you have coach, parents, others to help you see what had happened? Because that's one of the most important things as a competitor, isn't it? To really be able to assess how to improve. But you sound like you were really clinical about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was so mad with myself that I had right. a huge emotional backlash to start with. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely OK. You know, if you didn't get frustrated and annoyed uh, and, and angry, even, then it doesn't matter. So I, I did get all that. But I, I then once I calmed down, I looked at it. And whilst I did have a big team around, the conclusions that I drew, I kind of came to myself in, in that instance. Right. Well, that's pretty mature. For, at that age, you would have been 18. 18. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, first Olympics age 20? Yep, yep. Beijing? Amazing. Pretty special. Amazing, amazing, yeah. It was um, just the whole experience, yeah. you know. And we, we talked earlier about how my disability, I had um, those issues around self-worth, self-esteem. Yeah. And going to Beijing was actually the first time my disability had ever been irrelevant, which kind of sounds a bit daft because the Paralympics is is kind of built on that foundation of physical impairment but out there the focus was on ability yeah. and what people could do rather than what they yeah. couldn't and i guess uh, i've heard from other people in minority sports that sometimes turning up to something like that you suddenly realize you're alongside all these other competitors and you really are at the at the top of your game that must have been something inspiring as well oh it was amazing you know i just think meeting all the different athletes from yeah. different countries from different sports and you just learn so much yeah. And everyone was so nice and friendly. Wow. And then, I mean, without glossing over your multiple world uh, titles, you had the chance to compete to defend your Olympic title in, your, in London in yep. 2012. Yeah. Um, and that was a pretty amazing atmosphere. And I just watched this morning the video of your final, which came down to the final arrow. Yes, it did, yeah. Against your teammate. Yeah who got the silver. So can you tell us a bit about how it felt to be doing that in a home crowd situation? Oh, 
Oh, do you know, I think a lot of people talk about the home crowd advantage, and in yeah. many ways, I actually thought it was a home crowd disadvantage. Archery is one of those sports that you've got to try and keep your heart rate nice and mm. low and your nerves qu quite low. Uh, but going into the stadium, everyone's clapping, the music's blaring, and it's just like, oh, no, come on, get down, get down. Um, so it was really tough. There was so much pressure on me to win as well. Uh, every week in 2012, and I mean, I come from Paralympic archery, which is a low-profile sport, but I was getting two journalists a week ringing me up saying, you're the hot favourite to win. You must be under a lot of pressure. Mm. How do you feel? And it was like, great till you asked me that, thank you. Yeah. So it, it was really, really tough that those expectations, yep. being able to um, to deal with that was, was probably one of the hardest things I, I've done. But making the finals, I was coming away with a medal. I wanted the gold. My teammate wanted gold and it was just fighting it out. And that last arrow, it was who could deal with pressure better. And, and I sort of pulled it off. Wow. I mean, amazing. As you say, massive pressure because you're the defending Olympic champion and all of those things that have happened to you. So had you learned new things uh, or you just were more in control of your emotions and your heart rate? What, what, you know, what, what were you able to draw on on that day? So actually in Beijing, I had, going back there, I had a bit of a blip the night before my semi-finals. And um, the, the night before the semi-finals, I, I, I questioned myself and really doubted my ability. And it just started with one thought, one what if, which spiraled out of control until I genuinely believed that my dream of becoming Paralympic champion was impossible. And I was really lucky. I got a, an, an email from my equipment man and he told me I could shoot scores in my sleep that my competitors could only ever dream about. And even though that makes no sense whatsoever, the fact that somebody else believed in me that much gave me the boost I needed. In a moment of doubt. Yeah. Wow. And, and it was that I, when I won the next day, I was on the podium and I had this light bulb moment and realised that confidence was so important. So I'd spent the, the last four years working on my confidence because my whole life to that point, people kept telling me I needed to be more confident, but mm. nobody ever showed me how. how. How do you work on your confidence? So a lot of it I did was around redefining my definition of success. So, um, and taking the positives from every situation. So I might have been having a really bad day, but if I dealt with that bad day better than I had done previously, that was progress, that was still achievements. So rather than looking at all the negatives in the situation and where to make things better, it was just about really drawing out those positives. And the more I did that, uh, my confidence grew. The bigger my confidence got, the better my results got. Wow, uh, that's quite amazing. And then the other thing which you did was amazing, as we said, was you were the first uh, person to move from uh, a dis disabled sport to competing in an able-bodied representing England in the Commonwealth. Mm. Did that feel um, special, different, more challenging? How was that experience? Oh, it's a really weird experience, actually, because I got the selection scores a, a couple of days before the selection shoot. I was out in Arizona at a Paralympic training camp, and uh, I, I got the scores, and I hadn't, hadn't realised, checked my emails, and I got invited to, to the trials, which was happening the, the next Saturday. And they said, do you want to go? And I thought, well, not really. I'll, I'll go, go, coming back from America, I'm yeah. going to be jet lagged. I've just taken 10 days off. I was in my third year at university. I thought, I can't really afford to take any more yeah. time away from studies. Um, but my teammates persuaded me and thought it might, might be a good idea to go. And to be honest, playing with bows and arrows versus sitting in a room reading Studying law. Book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not really much of a contest. I see that. So, and, and of course, you mentioned you'd started yeah. off you know, competing in able-bodied competition. So I guess that wasn't quite such a, a strange thing for you. It was just about being on your game, was it? Yeah, yeah. T to be honest, at that time, I and one of the reasons why I was going to turn it down initially was it was always the plan to make the able-bodied team. Mm. Just that year, the, the standard, I wasn't quite sure my scores were there, but I just had an amazing year. My, my scores made a really big leap that year, and I was up there competing um, <laughs> with them, so... Wow. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible to have done that. And I think um, it wasn't uh, long before somebody else followed, you, followed suit. So Sarah's story, the cyclist, the next day became the second person to represent her country uh, on the naval sport as well. 
Yeah, yeah, we were both out there in Delhi, but uh, I think I, I'd qualified before she had, um, so the, the, the media followed that, and then I, I, I just got lucky because my event started before hers. So yeah, no, it was, but it was awesome that we were both. But, yeah, out quite there. a strong, uh, quite a strong uh, signal as well. Yeah. And um, I know that um, you know you were featured in Channel 4's coverage of the Paralympics, mm -hmm. uh, which really transformed attitudes here in the UK. So can you t tell us a bit about what it's been like to be somebody who's been featured? And, and look to as an example of ability amongst a sort of disabled sport. Has that, has that changed you much and what's that been like? Yeah, I, and I think actually it, I really realised the impact that it, it had made. Um, after London, I went to an award ceremony and uh, it was uh, a charity that had been doing a lot of work in the, the disabled field. And lots of people with disabilities were talking to me saying, oh, they're, they're amazing. They make me feel like a, a proper person. They, they speak to me, they treat me like I'm a proper person. Don't you get that? Uh, and I thought about it and I realized that because my confidence had been growing, mm. I didn't let people treat me any differently. Mm. And, and that was sort of quite a hard place to get to. Mm. But I think again, through the sport, uh, raising the profile of disability, mm -hmm. um, focusing and, and showcasing ability rather than disability was so important and mm. integral to that. Mm. Absolutely. I just remember that story in, around the Paralympics here where um, a child was reported as saying to their parent, oh, you know, is this person in the wheelchair, are they a Paralympian? Like in a really excited fashion and suddenly redefining that for, uh, for everybody. So you've played a huge part in that. Yes. Yeah. Um, now let's move on a little bit because then uh, you are thinking about a third Olympics or third Paralympics, mm -hmm. sorry, and Rio. But then the world changed um, based on rules. What happened there? Yeah, so after London 2012, the International Paralympic Committee decided to change the classification rule. So every Paralympic athlete has to be classified to determine whether your disability was severe enough. And it always passed, and it's always a very bittersweet moment. Mm. You know, you're like, yeah, yeah, I can go to the Paralympics, but I really didn't realise I was that bad. So, um, yeah, that was always, always quite tough. But... Um, I, under the new rules, I didn't uh, classify, and it was quite a humiliating and harrowing experience. So I was uh, on the physio bed. They, they test muscle strength and movement, and they were pulling and pushing my feet around. I, I was screaming. I was in that much pain. And when I was unable to walk away from the physio bed, they asked me why I was pretending to be paralysed. And, um, yeah, the next day, my national governing body told me that I failed and, and that was it. My, my career as a Paralympic athlete was over. That's brutal treatment. This is the International Federation doing this, the test? Um, yeah, the World Archery Classifiers, Crikey. yes. Crikey. And um, uh, I know you had a go at appealing but, but were unsuccessful, so that, that was really the end of it. Yeah, I'm, well, I actually made it worse. So uh, anybody with my condition, complex regional pain syndrome, can no longer compete in the Paralympics because one day um, my, my nervous system might reorganize itself and I may get better. So, but I've had it since I was 11. Okay, okay well, sorry, sorry to hear that story, but that also launched you on a new chapter. So tell us a bit about what you've been doing subsequently and then I'd love, I'd love to come on and talk a bit about the book as well. Yeah, well, to be honest, I didn't really know what to do. Yeah. I, I went through this complete identity crisis and I, I, I didn't even know where to start looking for a job or, or even what I wanted to do. And I decided that through sport, I'd learned so many important um, lessons and tools and strategies that perhaps I could help other people and decided to start my own business up. And I hadn't the first clue about business. I just jumped straight in uh, and learned a lot on, on the way, which has been really exciting. So I do a lot of speaking and training. I'm very, very passionate about diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. particularly looking at gender equality and mm -hmm. disability equality and looking at how we can do that um, in, in businesses and, and make the better cultures, better environment, uh, and really, really um, increase representation there. And I really love working with young people as well, so I'm really passionate about equipping young people with solid foundations mm -hmm. to have successful lives. Again, a really bold move, like pick yourself up, I'm gonna do this mm -hmm. um, you know, personal mission and make it a business. And now you work with some really big organizations. Can you tell us a bit about what you've learned about how organizations are in terms of inclusion and how they, we can all improve? 
Yeah, I'd say the, the area that I really, really am fascinated with um, the most, I would say, is the disability side. And I, mm. I say that because, well, it affects me personally, but it's one of the protected characteristics that could happen to any, any one of us. Mm. It's also the one, when you look at it, that falls way behind in terms of progress that we're making. So I find it really interesting to mm. go into organisations, look at policies and, and also that, that the inclusive practices. Mm. For me, inclusion, I think if we get that right, if we create really awesome environments for people and create environments where people can be their best and bring their best selves mm. to work, we're going to deliver better results. Mm -hmm. And um, any sort of practical advice for those of us who are working in organisations day by day that you say, like, if there's one thing you do or a couple of things you could do to make a difference, any suggestions? Yeah, I would say it, it's about noticing people's abilities. And I think we've all got amazing abilities. So looking at those rather than the things that we can't do and finding ways to do that. Sometimes it requires a bit of thinking out the box to make that happen. But I think also a lot of understanding. And, and for me, I, I really don't mind talking about my disability because if I can use my story and, and raise the profile and raise the awareness of people with disabilities, I, I think that's really, really important. And I, I find that it's an area that people can be sometimes quite nervous to talk about. Yeah. But I think initiating those conversations and not being afraid to ask whether people need help and, and providing them with the support they need rather than making assumptions about it's very important. It's definitely something where people make assumptions and we also, I guess, are afraid to get it wrong. Yes. Like, do I want to offer help? Do I not? What's the right language to use here? Um, so we should just overcome those fears, you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I, do you know what? I think if you're trying to make progress and I think if your intention is, is good, that you are going to make mistakes on that journey. But that doesn't matter if we can learn from those mistakes and make it better next time. That's the important bit. So I, I think that if you keep the, the conversation going and that really, really good communication, uh, an open, transparent communication around it, I think that's so important. Well, one of the ways you've started to communicate now is your recently published book. And I have to say, I got a copy and I picked it up and it says Danielle Brown and Nathan Kai. And I thought, oh, it's another great sports person who's got somebody to ghost write a book. But your co-author, how old is your co-author? He's nine years old. He's nine years old. How old was he when he started, when he pitched the idea of the book to you? He was seven when I met him, so yeah, two years ago. So just tell us a little bit about Nathan and how, how you came to write this book. It's an amazing story. Yes, yeah, so I was speaking at a Mensa event and uh, before I was about to speak, Nathan came up to me and introduced himself. And then he said, have you written a book for children about how they can be the best they can be? And I said, no, no, but that's such a good idea. Why the hell not? You're I nearly know, yeah. 30, for God's sake. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and, and you know what? It was a good idea because there are so many self-help books for adults. And, and I didn't realise there weren't anything out there for, for children. And he told me he'd been looking everywhere. He couldn't find one. Uh, I thought about it and said, can I write one with you? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to say no to that. Uh, we spent a, a year writing it. And I mean, it's, it's full of all sorts of great sort of practical things, eating well, being kind, but also how to break down and ambition into mm -hmm. steps. So lots of the things I guess you've learned the hard way uh, through, many, uh, through many of the things that you've done. But you also spend time, as, alongside your sort of consulting work with companies, you also spend quite a lot of time with children. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about, about that and what you've learned from doing that and what you see that makes a difference for them? Yeah, so well, for me, sport uh, managed to, it completely changed my life, you know, and it just turned uh, this disillusioned teenager uh, and created a world of possibility. And if I can help other young people, um, I, I just love being able to do that. So I do a lot around raising aspirations, building confidence and resilience, proactively looking at how we can improve mental health. So we know a lot of the things that we can do for our physical health, but mental health, there, there are so many things we can do to positively look after it, but most of the support there is when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? And also looking at exam <laughs> performance as well. So, and it's just amazing, so rewarding, especially when you've worked with somebody and um, yeah, they're, they're really struggling and you get messages later saying, you know, I'm going to university, that session that you did at school really turned my life around. It's wow. so rewarding. Any advice to parents of young children? I think we may have a few here. Um, you know, what can they do apart from buying the book? 
uh, which is available on good booksellers now for Christmas. Yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, just doing a plug for you. <laughs> Thank but, you. But you know, what would your recommendation to be a, to be a parent of a youngster or uh, an older sibling of a youngster? You know, what have you found that's been the most helpful? Oh, so I think do you know what? My parents gave me two fantastic bits of advice that I still use today. Uh, and the first one was that there's no such thing as can't. And that word was not allowed in my vocabulary at all. And I really credit that. That definitely went in, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And every time I said can't, you know, my parents would jump on it. There's no such thing as can't, you know. And that's kind of how I was brought up. And I think that, that really shaped my life uh, in a really positive way. And also, before all this growth mindset stuff mm. came out, my, my parents always praised effort. So if I gave something maximum mm. effort, they, they wouldn't be disappointed if I failed or, or, or won as long as I did my best. So it was about really prioritising that, and I think that's so important too. Well, well that's very wise advice. Um, I want to give people the chance to answer questions. If you, if you do have a question in the room here, then, then do please uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So have a think about that. Um, and so you've been somebody who's been very goal-driven, particularly the sort of, I know, the Olympics mm. cycle of uh, four yearly. So what do you think you want to achieve over the next chapter for you? How, how clear are you on what that ladder is for you and what the steps are? So I would like to do more writing um, and I would like to grow, grow my business. And I'm also working with another startup around disability investment and um, recruitment as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that grows. That's plenty, isn't it? Yes, yeah, lots of goals. So we have a question here, yeah. So I've always wanted to ask an archer, when it's, it's unrelated to, in the movies, how yep. correct do they get archery? The Hunger Games, the Avengers, how, how good is the archery? <laughs> oh, it is so the... funny. It's so funny. I think, yeah, we all have a uh, little giggle about the techniques and, like, there's no way you could, could hit anything like that. I think recently we were watching, um, is it the Vikings? And you just see them pulling the bows back and how quickly the arrows are going and you're like, really? Mm. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good fun. It's as bad as I thought it would be. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's all make-believe. Yeah. OK, that's a shame. Uh, any other questions here? We can go on. There's another one at the front. Thank oh. you. Um, th thanks very much for the, the, the coming and speaking. It's, it's been really enlightening. Um, I, as, as someone who's, who's got a, a young child as mm -hmm. myself, um, I'm always intrigued by sort of like the perspectives that they have on things that we kind of take for granted. Um, has there been any sort of like perspectives or ideas that is it, is it Nathan shared that um, you suddenly thought, actually, I need to kind of revisit some of this stuff? Yes, absolutely. So when we what we did was we discussed what being your best self meant and we split the chapters and I wrote my first three chapters and I'm like, you know what, I'm really proud of these. This is something that I talk about all the time. I know my stuff and I you know, I think I've written it really well. And I sent it across to him and it came back covered in strike throughs. <laughs> and I was just like, seriously. But no, he, he gave some really great advice there, which was that children don't like being told what to do. Right. And I was like, well, that is a really, really good point. You know, I don't particularly like being told what to do. And the, the, the fact that um, adults can quite often pass on advice in that authority position, we know best, we've got this experience. But actually, as children, that they need that guidance and support rather than being pushed in a certain direction. So that really, really helped shape the rest of the book. And it was about passing on messages of advice and, and support rather than do this, do that. You've got to try this. Yeah. What was the, what was the level of competition like between the Paralympics and the able-bodied? So what's the level difference in the scores and such between those two? Degrees. So it's definitely a lot higher in the able-bodied um, category. So you were looking at uh, a good 30, 40 points plus over the longer ranking rounds. So it was it was quite high. But making that team made me a much stronger competitor on the, the Paralympic mm. side. Mm. It was also a lot faster paced as well. So I had to get used to... Um, pushing my, my body at a faster pace to um, keep up with everybody, which that was hard work, uh, as well as trying to maintain the highest score levels too. 
So obviously sport's going through lots of changes now and there's mm -hmm. lots more around classification of athletes and identity and gender and so on. Do you still follow what's going on in the sporting world or is this something where you've really just moved on and it's time to do other things? Yeah, I think I do still follow sport yeah. and um, I, I love being involved because I just think sport's such a powerful vehicle yeah. for, for change for positive. Uh, and yeah, the... The, the new rule change, the new debates are very interesting. And if I'm perfectly honest, I really don't know where I sit mm. on the gender mm. identity side of things, because I do so much in the corporate world working with gender. And you've got one one thing there, but then you've got athletes coming up with a different point of view. And mm. I'm, I'm kind of sitting on the fence because I can mm. see both points. And I'm like, I I really don't, um, don't quite know where to go. And there's mm. some really difficult decisions to be made there. Yeah, yeah. And um, in terms of the world of work, you mentioned that, and what, you know, we, we talked a little bit about disability in that context, but you do an awful lot in terms of broader inclusion. You mentioned you know, wanting to champion women at work. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you've seen there, what needs to change, what, what you encourage people to do? Yeah, I think we are making some really amazing strides there. And where I'm fascinated, um, I, I felt through sport that I was treated equally. And I, you know, which is quite unusual because sport is one of those vocations where there is a, a big gap. So big when, gap on gender. A big gap yeah. on gender, yes, yeah. But I think because um, when you, when you win a gold medal, you get top level funding, whether you're male or female, yes. and. Uh, the support sometimes differs, but I'd built my own support team around me, so they helped me get there. Uh, it wasn't until I came out of sport that I really started to, to notice the, the difference in terms of the, the world of work. I started doing a lot of research. Um, one of the, my favorite projects, I've interviewed successful women in a variety of different fields to see if I could pinpoint characteristics mm. and skills and experiences that have helped them succeed. And that's been really, really enlightening in terms of uh, it's about the drive, the determination, the confidence. You know, mm. the confidence gaps are huge. Mm. And I think because of those physical uh, barriers that exist, we all change our behavior in light of those. So sometimes that can make um, women have less confidence and perhaps uh, men might have more confidence in light of those barriers. So it's what can we do as a person to try and upskill ourselves. So if we change our behavior, are we more likely to break through those mm. barriers? Well, you talk very convincingly about how you'd address your own sort of confidence mm. uh, problem and the tactics and skills you use to build confidence. How transferable you, have, you, have you found that when you've been working with women in the workplace or with uh, underrepresented groups in the workplace? Have you found that you can teach them those same techniques or is there something applicable there? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think all these skills are something that you can learn and you can apply to different areas. So success is success. It doesn't matter what field that is. And the skills to get there um, are not necessarily the same, but that the ingredients are. So things like your resilience, your confidence, your drive, being able to find a big challenge and break it down into more manageable steps, that, that, that's the same. So teaching people these strategies are very, very important. And uh, we've been seeing some really great results on the back of that. Fantastic. It was ins inspiring to hear about your work. Any final questions? Yeah. This will work. Oh, hi. Um, I really like your focus on um, the bit you were talking about focus, when it was talking about um, how your family brought you up mm. and those values that you stand true to. Now that we have more things to be distracted by, how do you kind of keep that focus going? Do you have any top tips that you can kind of share? You might have asked it, answered it throughout, but if there were three things you want to share on focus. Mm. Yeah. Great question. So I'm a big fan of prioritization. So uh, what I'll do is, um, when I was competing, I used to set myself a target for every session I went to. And it's the same now. I, every day before I even start doing work, I, I look at that day, what do I want to have achieved by the end of it? So I've, I've broken my things down into my important and urgent tasks, etc. And then I just create to-do lists. And every day I, I, I go through it. And of course, I, I never manage to tick everything off in a day. But then I, it rolls on to the next day. And I just find it's a really great way of organizing what I'm doing, keeping my focus there, and being able to work on the things that need doing straight away. One of the things about sport, I guess, my perception is that, um, as you said earlier, you know, you had to decide is it going to be practicing my arrows or is it going to be friends? 
And you can make very brutal sort of prioritization choices there because you can be very, as your mum said to you, very sort of selfish yeah. about it. When you're in the broader world, other stuff tends to intervene. So do you find it more difficult now because you've got many, many more demands on your time? You've got the stuff you're doing with schools and children, you've got your writing, you've got your business, your consulting, uh, all of this stuff. How do you manage the different trade-offs in those different areas versus I want to win an Olympic gold medal, therefore I'm going to shoot more arrows? That's really interesting because I've actually found that the when I left sport and sort of slotted straight into business, I thought it would be very similar in that it's ultra competitive and um, quite mercenary. And actually, sport sports are a very hard environment, and it, it's very very can be very toxic in some ways. Whereas I got into the, the business world and started learning about terms like collaboration and synergy <laughs> and networking, which is something that just didn't happen very right. often in sport. So actually, in terms of those friendships, I've, I've found that I love networking. I love meeting people and engaging with them and learning all about their stories and share, sharing mine. And I, I just think it's amazing. So you've, you've kind of building relationships and, and friendships, even though you're, you're working. So it's it's a different environment completely excellent well that, that's good to know we must remember not to be too single-minded about what we do what is it to be a freeman archer of the worshipful company of fletchers oh super so the uh worshipful company of fletchers is one of the old um guilds yeah so it was uh the, the arrow makers yep. yeah and i got the honorary position of freeman archer which um the worshipful fletchers are a fantastic uh, group they do a lot of supporting in terms of para archery and I just got invited after London which was amazing and they, I also I think the same day because of that they gave me the freedom of city of London so you can you can um, drive your sheep over any bridge you like at any time is that right? Yeah, and do you know the the weird thing is I've also got the Freeman um, the the freedom of the district of Craven up in North Yorkshire. Oh, that's handy. So I can walk my sheep down the high street and I can walk them across bridges in London. But what I'm supposed to do with them in the middle, I've got no clue. Well, there's something. Any engineers watching, please come up with a sort of sheep freighting solution, maybe with drones. But so for now, thank you so much for talking to us and such candid uh, insights into your success and what you're doing now. Super inspirational. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you.